What you see behind um, the wording is actually gosh. That's very traditional, obviously, because before you could go to any tattoo shop now, you can go into custom tattoos as long as you want. But before that was even a thing, you pick off what you want off flash that the artist made, and they usually do make on watercolor um, ink and such. So that's an example of a modern day traditional. So, American traditional tattoos and just tattoos grew notorious popularity around the 1940s. Um, usually, people in the middle, like in the military, would have tattoos so to um, significant, significant to establish their travels. Um, they had to have distinguishable um, body tattoos because if they were captured by an um, enemy or anything, they'd be recognized and they would know who they are. Um, this also was given by range and how long the range was started, so that's pretty cool. Here you have um, the bid, some tattooed sailors in the 1940s. The biggest picture you have here would usually be a captain. Um, if you were a lower ranking person or a rookie, you probably won't have as many tattoos because you were either you haven't traveled that far, you don't have that much experience, your rank is low, and you're probably not even that well known um, in your whatever area you're in. Or the Navy or Army, but these here are all sailors from the US Navy in the 1940s. You can see Captain right here, that would be cool. And all these, like the women right here, that usually means um, that they traveled the Atlantic Ocean and other places they knew that. And um, the stallions here, that's pretty popular in America for that traditional tattoo. This is what I'm except for like freedom and stuff. So, I guess he got this after he was out of the service. And they got to these really in their first tattoos. Um, American traditional expert, Sailor Jerry, you can thank him for basically modern traditional tattoo styles like this right here. The lady head and the traditional roses. And then I have one in honor of him right here. Um, traditional usually has bold lines and poppy color. Nowadays, you can see this black and gray traditional like I do. And that's still kind of the traditional thing, even sailors just got blocky there without color. Um, he is largely recognized the godfather of, of American traditional tattoo. He's right here. Um, he's not wearing gloves because back in the day, um, sanitation wasn't really that important. I don't know why, but um, if you're going to tattoo anybody now, you need gloves, um, protection for your machine, and all that good stuff. Sometimes people wear face masks too, just to be extra cautious so people don't really get sick around you. <clears throat> Um, modern day American traditional tattoos. Um, anyone who has the money and the resources can get American traditional now, not just say there's members of the army or navy or anything. Um, if someone's longer tattoo, you see women with tattoos are working in a tattoo parlor, like I, um, before, 
like people like Sailor Jerry and Cap, they wouldn't allow women in their tattoo parlors unless they were prostitutes to entertain the men. And the only person that worked with Sailor Jerry was Kate Shanghai. He trained her only because she was honorable. Um, all colors may be using these tattoos now, but before they had a limited color palette, which was black, green, red, and yellow, Sailor Jerry invented a color purple for tattooing. Um, tattoo flash is still used to this day, along with modern day custom tattooing. So if you go and down a, a memorial tattoo of someone that's passed away or anything, they can do that, as well as getting flash. And there's nothing wrong with getting flash tattoos. Like I have flash tattoos. Most of my life pieces is flash tattoos. It's just super traditional and it's cool to honor people that were before me in the tattooing industry. Here are some examples of, of traditional tattooing that's more modern. This is more of a neo-traditional tattoo. It's just traditional with more depth, um, shadows, obviously more vibrant colors and such. But all this is super really traditional, especially if you want to fill in the little um, gaps that you, that you can't fill in with regular tattoos. You can put in little stars, complete your sleep. And I'm working towards this right now, actually. So that's pretty cool. And I didn't really show traditional color because that's not my style, it's not what I draw, but here's an idea. So I have a video. We're going to watch about like two minutes of it. He does say some cuss words, but we're grown adults here. He does give a lot of good information. Um, he's a professional American tra traditional tattoo artist. He does do different kind of tattoos, but he mainly focuses on, on traditional gold plate tattoos. <laughs> I guess one of the, the first rules in these black work. Just clean lines, solid color, a real dramatic impact. The the cool thing, one of the things I love about traditional the most is that when you look at it, your mind doesn't have to take a long time to process it. As soon as you see it, it's so clean, everything so precise that your brain just instantly processes it and you're like, boom, that's a tiger. Boom, that's a ship. American traditional is, is extremely bold. It can look great on darker skin uh, because you can put bold lines, really solid, heavy, saturated color. And I think that's one thing with uh, American traditional or just traditional, you know, traditional worldwide. Color it tends to be way more saturated. So you put way more ink under the skin than a light shade. So if you put way more ink under the skin, that's a lot more ink that the body and sun has to break down. It's hard. Some people think that traditional is simple and it's easy and they're like, oh, that's stupid stuff. That's super easy. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've seen on TV shows where they're like having to do like a traditional tattoo on a TV show. And they're like, oh, that stuff's easy. And then they totally bomb. It's like the worst tattoo. And you're like, oh talking a lot of fucking shit right there and you can't even do it and I guess as far as what brought me to American tradition it's been it's been a really long road because I started off doing fine line black and gray and then in the 90s I did a lot of new school and then it was kind of a slow gradual like like I did this pencil that was like all whiny and bendy new school and then over time, that pencil eventually started straightening out, and I saw that years ago, and there was one that stayed, and that was traditional, and it was timeless. Like you can look at someone's tattoo and be like, "You got that in the '90s? Oh, you got that in the early 2000s, or, or whatever, you know." But you can look at a traditional tattoo, and you kind of got to look and guess how old the tattoo is to see what it means when they got it. It's really nice to. Uh, to honor those that came before us. And um, it's not going anywhere. Yeah, American tradition is pretty nice. <clears throat> um, in conclusion, basically, what he like he said, traditional isn't going anywhere. I mean, it's the most purest form of tattoos that you can get here in the United States. I mean, you have Japanese traditional and the traditional um, Inca tattoos, like from Mexico. But um, I just think if you're really into American tattooing, you can get an American traditional tattoo. Traditional tattoo. You can get them anything you want. You get a lady head, a tiger, a dog. It doesn't really matter who's on. As long as it's to your fitting and you want to honor those before you in tattooing, go for it. Um, 
and it's not going anywhere, just like we said. So today I'm going to be talking about the Alamo. Now, as someone from Texas, the Alamo has extreme importance to me because my entire time in school, or not maybe the entire time, but most of the time I was in school, I was learning about the Alamo. And um, there's even history classes you can take in Texas that are completely like centered around Texas uh, history. And one of the biggest sections you'll take is definitely the Alamo. So I just wanted to talk about that today. So what is the Alamo? The Alamo is an old mission in San Antonio, Texas, named uh, Mission San Antonio de Verdero. Um, it was uh, made originally for the intent of, you know, the Spanish conquistadors. They were coming through, conquering everything, and they were trying to also spread the word of uh, Christianity. So they built it, but it actually was never finished. It was never even um, like the roof didn't even exist on the top. <laughs> So uh, because of all the fighting that was taking place, it just became a fort. So as it says on the bottom, it was eventually renamed the Alamo because it was uh, being occupied by Spanish soldiers. And they named it for the cottonwood trees around, which is Spanish, and, or cottonwood in Spanish, the Alamo. And um, for their hometown, Alamo, they set up. So the significance of the Alamo is because uh, and the Texas Revolution, it holds, held the most, uh, the biggest battle of the, um, of the revolution. Um, after it was captured by the rebels, after the Spanish soldiers had been kicked out during the Texas Revolutionary War, uh, Sam Houston, the leader of the rebels, um, actually told everyone in the Alamo that they should get out because they were extremely outnumbered and they, they should, like, um, regroup. However, the people there decided that they would stay. And as you all know, Davy Crockett was there. Also, James Bowie and William Travis, which I'll talk about briefly. Um, James Bowie, he's uh, known for the Bowie Knife, and also he was a great American fighter. He is best known for his sandbar fight, where he was shot three times, stabbed seven times, and still won a fight against someone. So that's his legacy. William Travis, the lawyer who led them all in the fight, and then Davy Crockett, everyone knows Davy Crockett, the legend who, uh, you know, always wore the clean hat and then also uh, wrestled a bear at like three years old. There's a lot of stuff in his life that, <laughs> that is all legend, but they were all there and they all decided to defend the fort against the upcoming Mexican forces. So to um, talk about what happened with the battle, I have a short video. 
That basically summarizes everything that went down that day. This former Catholic mission is surrounded by downtown San Antonio and is received today only by tourists. But in March of 1836, a band of almost 200 Texan rebels were barricaded inside the Alamo, including legendary frontiersmen William Travis, Davy Crockett, and Jim Bowie. Outside, they were surrounded by an army of more than 1,800 Texans under General Antonio Rosas de Santa Ana, who was also the president of Mexico. Santa Ana ordered the Texans to surrender on pain of death. Setting the stage for a tragedy that reached its final act on March 6th when the Mexicans moved in. The outnumbered men in the Alamo fought heroically, but they were still overwhelmed. Those who didn't die in battle were executed, just as Santa Ana had promised. And it is that day, cries of Remember the Alamo have filled the Texas air. But the Texas Revolution wasn't over yet. Outside modern day Houston lies an ancient ruin. The historic site where Texas's independence was finally won. Today, the Battle of San Jacinto Monument marks the spot where, on April 21, 1836, the Rebel Army got its revenge. Led by General Sam Houston, they too were outnumbered. They managed to outfox and outfight the Mexicans, and even captured Santa Ana himself. The Mexican president had no choice but to surrender, finally giving Texas its independence. The new Republic of Texas took its own country for almost 10 years. Sam Houston, the hero of the revolution, was elected the Republic's first president. So basically to summarize what happened at the Alamo. Um, they were stationed there on like February 8th or no, no February 26th. And that's when the uh, Mexican forces first showed up. And when they first showed up, there was about a thousand of them. But over time, they kept building up to what historians predicted probably or guess is going to was about like 6,000 troops. Um, and so basically, Santa Ana decided to use the tactic of wearing out the soldiers within the Alamo because there was only 200 people in the Alamo versus 6,000 Mexican troops in the Alamo. So they basically peppered them with cannon shots until they were so tired that they stopped shooting them and everyone fell asleep and they attacked in the middle of the night with 6,000 soldiers still. But um, it wasn't necessarily a loss because Santa Ana's army suffered huge casualties. Historians guess that there was nearly 10 soldiers killed for every rebel in the Alamo. So for every person in the Alamo, they killed 10 uh, Mexican soldiers. So. It actually came more of like a win for them. And then also Sam Houston was then able to intercept Santa Ana's movement and um, find him and win another battle where they were outnumbered and captured the president to win the war. So during the, the final battle of San Jacinto, um, everyone, all of the Texans that were fighting in the battle were basically shouting, remember the Alamo, to show uh, their attrition and um, the, their commitment to the war and freedom. So. Um, significance, like I said, uh, this is where the saying, remember the Alamo came from. And it's very symbolic to Texans, to not only us, but to a lot of people in the United States. And for me, it represents that there's no cost to be great for freedom. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of different ways you can interpret it, um, like hard work and, you know, fighting to it pays off, you know, for other people. You can look at it in many different ways. It's truly like one of the greatest events in history that I feel about to this day. And for my last slide, I wanted to go into some fun facts about it because I had some questions about what happened there. So I was asked about why Davy Crockett was just there in the first place. Um, he was actually there because he lost his re-election for Congress in Tennessee. And he is quoted by saying, I am a, I'm faithful to my people in Tennessee, but the moment that I lose the re-election, um, y'all can go to hell and I'm gonna go to Texas. And that's what exactly what he did. And he brought his friends with them all the way from Tennessee. And as soon as they got there, they were greeted with lots of love and passion. 
and they were promised by the um, the government they had at the time, not really a government, but you know, the, the rebel force that if they won the war, him and all of his friends could get uh, 4,600 acres of land in Texas. So they decided to join, and <clears throat> their first and final assignment was the Alamo. So, um, and then Travis, um, as depicted in the film, Travis would be the one on the far right. Um, he was the leader of the men in the Alamo, and because their resources were so low, he actually told all the soldiers to conserve their ammo and their out, except for Crockett and his men, which he highly urged to use as much as possible over the days they were there because they basically wouldn't miss. <laughs> like, he was like, take as many shots as you like for the rest of everyone else, just relax and wait until they're the bigger fight. And then lastly, I was asked about the accuracy of the film. Um, there was two films made. I didn't know this until yesterday. There was one adapted in 2004, which is depicted on the top right, and then there's one adapted in 1960, I believe, with John Wayne. Um, John Wayne movie, apparently so, was not very accurate. It was just more about the action that happened there. So I don't know. Um, but the 2004 movie was more accurate historically wise. However, I watched it, and personally, it wasn't as like epic or anything. So if you're looking for some action, you can watch the Alamo in the bottom right. And then if you wanted to see what actually happened or a more accurate depiction of it, I would highly recommend watching the newer version. So in conclusion, um, the Alamo is just a really symbolic battle to me. I think it's one of the most important ones in Texas history. And maybe one of the most significant ones in all of history just shows the uh, the fight for man and what they'll do for freedom. So uh, thank you. Right. Good morning. So, did you know that about 20% of our school age population has, is involved in some sort of special education? They have some sort of disability. Now, that ranges anything from being on the autism spectrum to having social anxiety. So, it's a very broad term. Uh, it's actually one of the issues I'm going to talk about is the blanket term that everyone is kind of put under uh, that is part of this community. So socioeconomic issues. Students in special education are more likely to be ridiculed and bullied. Uh, by their peers um, for what they have, you know. Being separated out from society causes a lot of issues, you know. The lunchroom is one of the, the biggest places where people are typically bullied. That's where a lot of this happens. Um, I saw a lot of it when I was in school. Um, those students would come in and people would laugh and giggle and that kind of stuff. Um, 
if you look at the second point, this is not limited. Uh, my speech is mostly about the United States and our issues, but it's a worldwide thing. This article here from uh, Ken Dali is about Ireland and their system, which I actually decided to read a little bit more about Ireland's system. And it looks to be a basic copy of America's system. Um, students are somewhere between 20 and 40% more likely to develop depression, anxiety, suicidal thoughts in the special education system as opposed to their general population peers. And oftentimes these compound onto already having, you know, some sort of uh, emotional or physical disability and those things combined and it's not a very fun situation. And I learned that even the teachers, uh, because special education teachers are tasked with teaching, you know, music, science, math, social studies and language arts, they're put under more pressure. And uh, regular teachers, a lot of times do not respect them the same way. And so special education teachers also get ridiculed. This is um, a little video on the history. I will take us to at the end, if we have time. <clears throat> so I said I was gonna talk about the graduation issue. Well, as of 2016, 24 states had a, what's uh, referred to as an alternative degree. And you can access these through the IEP program, the LAE program. I think there's one called STAR. You have the 504 plan. Um, 504 and IEP are very common in the state of Georgia. And these are alternatives to a high school diploma. Um, there are lots of schools that are what's referred to as a Title I school. And so basically that is a low income school that has really high test grades. Well, if you have these people that the school system has deemed to be different, if they do poorly on exams, which I'm, I imagine some of us in here, I have to taking anxiety. I never performed very well on tests. And the schools didn't like that. And so a lot of times they come to the parent and they recommend a alternative graduation plan. Well, that alternative graduation plan turns into uh, most job applications require at least a high school diploma. That doesn't count. Most college entrance exams require a college, a high school diploma or equivalent. That's not an equivalent. And so with that, 14% of today's population has not graduated high school. That's another graduation issue. And 36% of those students or former students have a learning disability and 59% have an emotional or behavioral disorder. And that's things like, you know, social anxiety to ADHD. Moving forward, we have um, something that a lot of people um, like me that talk about the disparities in our educational system bring up the topic of what about students that get put in general population? Well, that's a great thing, but it is a minefield, just like everything else in this field. There is a lot of toes you can step on. You know, you have to deal with politicians, you have to deal with principals, you have to deal with other administrators, the Secretary of Education, there's quite a few schools uh, that I know of that do allow um, people such as like high, fun high functioning autistic children to be part of general population. It is a great thing, but a lot of those students get ridiculed just the same. And so they can learn valuable social skills that they would not learn separated from those other students, but there also is the barrier of 
there's a social divide where we need to talk about this in the classroom as everyone is just like each other. We're all unique in our own way, and that's something that we should all respect. And so that's why some people don't want to attack that subject, and so they just let these students suffer. And yes, uh, not every situation. There are some students that have uh, physical disabilities that unfortunately cannot be part of you know, the idea of a modern classroom. And so as I pull up this video, uh, how much time do I have? Huh? Okay. Oh no. Okay. Awesome. Good grammar and spelling are important. I will play a little bit of this. To write essays that inspire messages that forge brighter. Hello and welcome to Teachings in Education with Frank Avella, the history of special education. In the United States today, all students with disabilities have the right to special education services in a free public education. These children are protected by law. Students classified as having disabilities are afforded accommodations and modifications. Accommodations are related to access to content, while modifications allow for changes to content. No doubt, these students benefit greatly from them today. However, this wasn't always the case. It was only with the help of certain advocacy groups. These advocacy groups were usually formed by parents of students with special needs and other members of that community. The advocacy groups lobbied and fought for these children by bringing their plight to the public eye, as well as putting pressure on local and state politicians. They got the public involved. All right, that's just you know, how the process went. Um, in this video, it doesn't necessarily talk about the, um, the accommodations or the precedent that was put in place to allow that. Um, you have the Americans with Disability Act. So that is um, what requires wheelchair ramps, the handles, the door handles with the hooks on them are for people that are missing an appendage so that they can open the door with a hook. It has to have the hook on it so that you have something to grab a hold of. It also protects um, students in the classroom. Teachers cannot have air freshers inside of classroom because of the ADA. Uh, schools can actually get in a lot of trouble with that and a lot of them don't follow it. That is the same regulations that provide equal access. We also have the um, the constitutional amendments that were created uh, during Reconstruction, with um, you know equal opportunity, and we have some Supreme Court precedent for um, involving the uh, civil rights movement. Those uh, Supreme Court precedents actually play into. <laughs> allowing equal access for special education students in this country. So as I wrap up, um, I hope we've all learned that special education is something that is still very much a new topic. It has not been perfected. It's still rough around the edges. Um, we have issues with bullying and kids not graduating and all that kind of stuff. So. I will leave you with a question. Uh, as we all grow up and some of us consider having children, it is our responsibility as the next generation to fix the problems that the people before us have created. And so how would you want your kids to grow up? And that is it.
so uh, last week I asked, or I think the week before last, uh, I asked y'all if y'all have any, any idea how the game baseball is played, how many of you raised your hand at all. So for this uh, presentation, like, I just did the base rules, nothing like too detailed, it's just the main focus of the game and how like little leaguers would play pretty much. But um, to start off, I just want to talk about the origin of the game. It's kind of funny because like historians still honestly don't know who came up with the game of baseball. Uh, the U.S. and then um, the British are still in like an argument about who uh, came up with the game first. And um, I think back to the 1300s in um, uh, Britain, they played this game they called the Rounders, and it was still played on a field with a bat and a ball and then a triangular, triangular shaped field. And they had uh, foul poles on both sides of the field, which is basically what a baseball field looks like to this day. And then the first mention of the baseball in the US were in uh, Pittsburgh, Massachusetts in 1791. And then by the late 1830s, they started forming a professional league as well. But um, for the rules, to start off with unwritten rules, it's just basically like player etiquette. Um, showing respect to the other team, the other players on the field. Uh, personal, don't steal bases, swing at 3-0 pitches, or otherwise run up and score when I hit by a large margin. That's pretty much just showing respect. If you're up 10 nothing, there's no reason to steal a third base or uh, swing 3-0 because, I mean, guys are having a rough day. Uh, don't steal bases or strut after home runs. Went behind by a large margin, so if you're down 10 nothing, you shouldn't attempt a home run. Because that just looks dumb. Uh, don't step on a pitcher's mound because for some reason pitchers don't like that. They uh, not at all. Um, don't walk when you're walking up to the plate. You don't walk in front of the catcher or the umpire because uh, that's what, that's showing respect to the catcher to not walk in front of him as well. And then um, the jinx is a very big thing in baseball. So like when there's a no hitter, which is where a pitcher goes nine innings but not allowing a single hit. Um, there's like a big jinx to where if someone brings it up to him or anybody on the team, it always gets ruined, no matter like what part of the game it's at. And then um, another one, never make the first or third out of the inning at third base because technically second base is scoring position. So if you get thrown out third, there's no reason because you basically blew it on. That's it. And then a few more on written rules. Um, don't yell anything when opposing fielder is trying to catch a ball. A few years ago, I don't know if y'all know who Alex Rodriguez is. Um, he was in his dugout, and the third baseman of the other team uh, was uh, trying to catch a pop up. And Alex Rodriguez was in his dugout and said, I got it. Like he called the ball. And the guy backed off, and the ball just landed without care for it. So ever since then, like people have gotten on him about everything. Um, in baseball, the center fielder always has priority of the ball. So if there's a fly ball on um, the outfield, if the center fielder can get there, you let him catch it. It's just how it's always been. Um, and then it's like a macho thing. If you, um, when you get hit by a pitch, no matter how hard it is, how much it hurts, you don't let it. You just go first base. Uh, moving on to the offensive rules. Um, each lineup per team has nine players in it. And uh, you must hit in that lineup in that order. You can't. Um, Mix it up at all unless you bring in a designated hitter or pinch hitter. Um, each team gets three outs per inning to score. Once you get three outs, you have to switch it up the next half inning. Um, each batter is allowed two strikes as well as um, you can work up to four balls. If you get three strikes, you can out strike out. You can strike out looking or swinging. And then if you uh, receive four balls, you're awarded first base and some considered a walk. If the batter is hit by a pitch, he's awarded first base, goes down to the hits batsman, and it counts as a walk as well. Um, if the batter swings and the bat hits the catcher on any part of his body, that is considered catching with him. So you can hit him in his glove, his necklace, whatever it is. If your bat touches him, you go to first base, and it counts as a walk as well. Uh, continue on with the offensive rules. Um, if the batter tries to run with two strikes and fouls off the ball, that's considered the same thing as swinging and missing because they don't want you sitting there trying to bunt all the time and keep on fouling off. We have like 30 pitch at bats if you could do that. Um, if the batter hits the ball over the outfield in fair territory, it's considered a home run. I'm pretty sure everyone knows that. Um, 
when a base runner runs from one base to the next while the pitcher is uh, throwing the ball the home plate, that's considered a stolen base. You can steal second, third, and some guys are even stolen home if the pitcher has a, a long line. Up. All right, um, moving on to some defensive rules. Um, there can only be nine players on the field, and that's including the pitcher. Those positions include catcher, first base, second base, shortstop, third base, left field, center field, and right. Um, the play can only begin when the pitcher throws the ball at home plate, or if he attempts to uh, take off, the ball gets away, goes down the line. Um, there are endless amounts of ways to uh, record not baseball, but the most uh, common ones is a strikeout, a uh, put out, which is like a line out to an infielder, a uh, double play, or a uh, fly out to the outfield. If a uh, ball is uh, thrown into the stands, the base runner is going next to base. So they throw it to first, bounces off the uh, first baseman's glove, goes up into the stands, or about if it rolls into the dugout as well, it's considered a dead ball. They're awarded an extra base off of their. Uh, they're a single for air. Um, if a pitcher balks, a balk is where, so when the pitcher is on the mound, once he's on the mound, he can't move from the pitch like this or anything like that. Because once you do that, it's it could throw the hitter off. And that's why they made it illegal. So if a pitcher balks, um, if there's a base runner on, he moves to the next base. So if he's on third, it's pretty done right there. But if nobody's on base, the uh, batter is given the ball. And then um, each inning, the defense must record three outs to move on to the next half. I've got this short video. The goal of baseball is to score more runs than the other team. The team that scores the most runs by the end of the game wins. To score a run, first try to hit the ball with a baseball bat when the pitcher throws it to you. If you miss the ball, you get a strike. And once you get three strikes, you're out. When you hit the ball, run counterclockwise around the three bases and back to the home plate you started at. If you make it back without getting out, you score a run for your team. If you can't make it all the way back, you can stop at first, second, or third base, and wait for the next player for your team to bat. Then, if they hit the ball, you can continue running along the bases toward the home plate. Keep in mind that the other team will be trying to get you out while you're running the bases. There are three ways they can do that. First, if the other team picks up the ball, and beats you to your base with it, you're out. Second, if a player on the other team is holding the ball and they tag you with it, that means you're out. Finally, if you hit the ball and the opposing team catches it in the air, you're out. Once your team has three outs, move to the outfield and try to stop the other team from scoring runs by getting them out. After each team has gone up to bat, that's the end of the first inning. In the official rules, there are nine innings in a baseball game. Since there are no ties in baseball, keep playing additional innings if necessary until one team wins. All right, and that is it for my presentation. Okay. Thank you, Scott. Let's give uh, all of the presenters another round of applause. On Wednesday, we will finish up with the last presenter. We will hear from Matthew Doham, uh, Noah Payne. We will also hear from Madison Father and Destiny Keenan. What you should do, uh, go ahead and begin reading chapter 16, seeking to persuade. And I will also, on Camden, post some additional assignments. So go ahead and do that. And Stay safe, everyone, and have a good day.